grow the things that grow well for you. Pollinators, you know, are very easy to attract, but plant densely so that you can't see the soil by the end of May, because then you've got um, a shady understory where you're going to get beetles and insects. The best beloved is a botanist and he left me in the scrub. He said, I'll go and get the car and I will pick you up. So I'm in the scrub, fairly close to the road. I can't move because I'm afraid if I do, he won't find me. He was two hours. I said, where have you been? Looking for gladiolus, cardinalis, he said. Hmm. Hello and welcome to episode 54 of Talking Dirty. Over at East Ruston Old Vicarage, looking mellow yellow this lovely morning, we have Alan Edward Herbert Gray, our happy and very handsome horticulturalist. And tantalising in turquoise. <laughs> Over in Cambridgeshire, we have the most delightful Thodis Maria Fr Sophia Fredrickson. How are you? I'm very well. Do you know, this is yet yeah. another floral number from my wardrobe. It is a bit like you open the doors and it's a herbaceous border in there. I oh, have that's always, right. that's fine. always been drawn to florals. <laughs> Looking wonderful, delightful in her dungarees is a regular on this podcast, a dear friend of ours, Bridget, I think Lisa girly oh yes i seem to remember um though you're making me overheat a little bit because it's very muggy in cambridgeshire and yet you over the border in sort of norfolk suffolk you look like it's a lot colder well i'm a bit of a chilly beast <laughs> i definitely don't have warm blood <laughs> i can't stand being cold so i thought right it's forecast for rain and thunder. I'm putting my jumper on and I'm not <laughs> regretting it yet. But if you make me laugh too much, I might overheat. <laughs> well, I think that's the thing. I normally get carried away. I get excited when we record these podcasts and I overheat. So I have to come prepared for that. Um, the other <laughs> thing I should warn people about and kind of prepare people for is if you're watching the video version, Bridget's just tantalising us with this beautiful bunch of flowers over your shoulder, but you have no intention of talking about it. You've just set dress. No. <laughs> <laughs> Look like no, there's some lovely scabies They're not in up there. for discussion. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there is some lovely scabies. And look at this. Oh, <laughs> now look, you're making me do it. But look at this. Crazy little cosmos. <gasps> do you know which one? Most... Well, <laughs> I got the seeds from Swan Cottage. Isn't it? It's just its own flamenco dancer. It's just yeah, yeah. incredible. I just thought I had to have that here. Especially wow. for you, Thordis, really. Yeah, that's a... Your colour. Yeah, it's uh, that's lovely. It's all frilly and floofy, and I do love frilly and floofy. I think I, because I do a Cosmos a year, I normally only let myself have one because of my small garden. And this year, uh, it, is it the cupcakes mix that mm. you oh, and yes. Jane Ann Walton have talked about? But I must confess that most of the ones that have not been eaten by slugs and have come to flower look a lot more like purity. I've got one or two that are doing something different, but a lot of them just look like a nice white cosmos. I think lots of seed manufacturers need to perhaps refine some of their, their cosmos because I think this is generally true. I mean, you need to grow cupcakes and nothing but cupcakes isolated from any other cosmos. And you probably need to grow them more than more than once. I mean, two or three times and rogue out any, um, any wrong ones. Cupcakes always remind me, if you turn them upside down, a little bit of jellyfish. <laughs> floating in the sea. Can you see what I mean? Because they yes. have that, that kind of sort of fluted edge, you expect it to go boom, boom, <laughs> boom, boom. <laughs> I've got a really horrible true confession, but they don't really do it for me, the cupcakes. Oh, that's that a right. bad thing to say? No, that no, is no, no. Allowed. I, oh, I kind God. of like it when people admit that they don't like something. I, um, I grew Beaujolais Bonnets, the scabious this year. And I don't know if it's just mine, but they look very different to any of the photos I'd seen. They're, they're quite brash. They're very red and the white sort of out of their stamens. It's, it's not, it's fine next to something else, as long as it gets lost amidst like another flower, but all on its own, it's a bit sort of too much in my face. So I'm, I'm yes. that, uh, but then everyone else loves it, but it's okay. Maybe I got a duff one or maybe I just don't like it, but we're allowed to dislike things, Bridget. Oh, good. You know, this this it provokes discussion, doesn't it, amongst us? And I mean, we 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 shouldn't all like the same things, otherwise, 
our houses, our clothes would all be identical. Um, and, and so would our garden. So it's really rather nice that people don't like the same things. I mean, um, I, but I do find it fascinating um, when you talk to people over a period of years, how their tastes change. Yes. <laughs> and they are very, very influenced with fashion, I have to say. I remember talking to um, a friend of mine and his late wife, Hilary, and Hilary was very precise about her color schemes in the garden. And I was eulogizing about um, a kufaya that I had. And I went on and on and on. And I said, Hilary, I can tell that you're not convinced. And she said two words. It's orange. Oh. <laughs> and I suddenly thought, you know, how the worm has turned. Because, I mean, I know, Thunder, that you love orange. I love orange, too. Um, Bridget, I've noticed that a little bit of orange is creeping into your flower arranging. As it I is. can see next to you, Easy. <laughs> Um, but, you know, there are oranges and there are oranges. Mm. And if you take, um, shall we say, a zinnia called Benary's giant orange, that is orange like no other, as is the Mexican sunflower Tithonia. Yeah, yes. They are orange in all its strength and beauty if you love it. But, you know, you get it touched with sort of a little bit of apricot and mm. orange suddenly mellows. And it is no longer brashing in your face. And it's infinitely usable in the garden. And it's like people that don't like yellow. I feel terribly sorry for them because we're just coming to that time of the year when sunflowers, helianthus, heliopsis, all of those things are coming to the fore. And if you don't like yellow, God help you. <laughs> you have to sow exclusively all the kind of maroon chocolatey sunflowers. You know, one of the classic combinations is um is well i suppose springtime really isn't it yellow and blue i mean we're thinking of yellow daffodils and perhaps blue um scillas and things like that and, and and it goes on yellow and blue and you get this a lovely touch with acidic foliage um as you might get on the numularia that creeping jenny thing with which if you grow it in full sun it's bright yellow and the bright yellow gets scorches a bit but if you grow it in shade it's that lovely acid sharp lime green um, and, you know, everything sort of, what I'm trying to say is it doesn't have to be brown in your face. All of these yellows and oranges that people say they don't like can be toned down. Mm. And it really matters to what, you know, the ingredients that you put together to, uh, mm. to leaven, if you like, even out the, the overall scheme and give it coherence. And of course, that's something that happens for you, Bridget, as moss and mm. stone floral design. We all avidly follow your wonderful floral extravaganzas that you put together but it is often about having something that will leaven or something that will pop you need all those different elements I think you really do and I think Alan's just hit the nail on the head it's finding those elements that will just blend and take you into a slightly different mm. color within the color theme which which can soften things I mean if you want to go bold you just put in everything but you kind of have to go violently putting in everything to make it look really amazing because I think if you're really really soft soft, 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 and then something really wild, that can be odd, although that has its own beauty as well. There's, I mean, anything goes really. I just think, I just think anything goes. And, and I think you're also right, Alan, your, your tastes change. And, and sometimes mm. you can think, I would hate to have bright red, bright orange, bright yellow, bright blue, bright purple. I couldn't stand all of those things together. And then you put them all together and you go, wow, that looks incredible. I love it. And maybe what you need is that acidy green to just make it all come alive and make sense. So it's finding a way of using colour and just making it exciting. You know, and and you also... don't have to please anybody else either. You just have to please yourself. <laughs> exactly. That's, that's a very good point. One should stick to one's principles and, and please yourself. One thing I've been doing this week is I've been planting up the, the four beds around the um, central pond in the sunk garden. And um, I sort of kind of started and it, it was a bit half assed, I have to say. And I kind of <laughs> ran out of ideas. And then I was um, somebody very kindly gave me a load of goldfish and koi the other day because she's moving. And I took them and I put them in the in the pond, you see. And then I thought oh gosh, I've got to do something with these borders and what, what shall I do with them? And it is a bit of a dog's breakfast because there's everything in there. But I thought I need something to run through to leaven this, to, to make it coherent, to join it together and knit it. And the only thing I had was two trays of seven centre, centimetre pots. Uh, that's a 30 plants of a salvia. And it's a bright red salvia. I can't think of the name of it now, but it's got a very dark calyx. And I just threaded all the way through and it, it worked. 
Now, don't tell, ask me why or how it worked. Maybe it's because I've got lots of dark leaves there. I was going with the theme of dark leaves. I was going with dark leaves, creams, whites, pinks, and lemons. Um, and then I suddenly thought, hell, come on. Let's, you know, stir it up a bit. Bright, bright red. Royal Bumble, that was the sound. I did there. wonder. Um, <laughs> yeah. Royal Bumble. So Royal Bumble is bumbling her way through all my four beds and, and knitting them all together beautifully. And it, it's, it's suddenly actually doing things like that inspires you to be, to go even further, doesn't it? It pushes you, makes you push your boundaries, which I think is important. I think so. Sometimes you just need to scare yourself because, I mean, what's the worst that can happen? We're not talking about brain surgery here, are we? It's, <laughs> you know, um, if it doesn't work, no. change it. But, you know, it might, it might be magical if you try it. Yeah. I think the, the lesson to be learned is when I think somebody came here to the, to the house once and they brought me a bunch of, we'll say florist roses, you know what I mean. Hmm. Um, I, I can't bear things like that, to be quite honest. See, I'm, straight I'm, things. I'm, yeah, yeah, very straight things. And they just looked horrendous. <laughs> so I cut them, cut all the stems really short, found a wide, low container, and I just pushed in masses and masses of foliage. I mean, I can't tell you what it all was. It doesn't matter. Um, but just changing the character of those stiff stemmed straight things um, altered them completely. And I thought, oh, they look rather nuts, actually. I could do that again. <laughs> I never have, but I could. <laughs> I know when Bridget and I came for a walk around your garden much earlier in the year, one of the things that you had threading through the garden is that wonderful Smyrnian perfoliatum, mm. which I also yes. was coveting. I basically cover every year. I don't know why I don't have it, <laughs> but it's one of those things I always forget to grow. Um, but Beth Chateau's garden, loads of it, just bring everything together and popping and zinging and just working in so many different situations. Wonderful plant. It was beautiful, wasn't it? Mm. Can you grow it from seed? Is it easy from seed? Very easy from seed. We need to go under cover of darkness and nick a little bit. You know, if, you, if you, Bridget, if you can be prompt and do this, I'll, I mean, just send me your address and I'll, um, you know, wing me your address over in the computer and I'll put some in an envelope. I think we've still got some left ready for gathering. And what you do is you, this is the way I first grew it. I was at Great Dixter and I said, what is that? And I said, is it a, a, a euphorbia, you see? And uh, Christo said, no, it's not. It's Smyrnium perfoliatum. And I said, what is it? And he said, well, would you like it? And I said, yes. He said, take some seed. So I took a handful of seed, you know, just off the plant. He said, take it where you want it and bung it down. Just chuck it and forget it. And that's what you do. But the one thing about this um, particular plant is it's, it's either a biennial or it might even be a triennial, depending on how big it makes its growth in its first year. I mean, first year is flat. Um, leaves to the ground second year it sends up the spike of flowers um, if you get a colony of it going you'll get some every year so some years that'll be very prolific some years not quite so mm. much um, that's how that's the nature of the beast but I think the other thing that you have to realize is that it needs grubbing out the moment the stems start to go yellow because it it doesn't die with dignity uh. it, it dies just gracefully <laughs> <laughs> so you have to go around and just grub it out. I mean, take a wheelbarrow and a pair of gloves and just pull it out mm. um, and it refreshes everything. And you've got it under trees, haven't you? And it seems to be doing yeah, well. Yeah, frozen shade, semi-shade, or um, I don't know whether I've actually got it in full sun. I mean, I'm sure there are some that grows in full sun, um, but it's just one of those plants that probably is much easier to grow fresh from seed, as yes. is um, a little impatiens that we grow called uh, impatiens balfourii which is a very pretty little, it's a bit like policeman's helmet, you know, that horrible thug of a thing, which is too big in all its parts. Um, but this one <laughs> reaches about 60 centimetres or a bit more tall. Um, and it's discreet in the shade of sort of fairly strong, but, and then a pale pink lower part to the, to the flower. It's very nice. But again, that's something that you probably wouldn't even think of growing until you see it in somebody's garden. And again, it was a gift from Dixter. So it's, 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 very, it, it's very close to my heart. I love it. I like the inform informality, you see. Um, there's not many parts of my garden that are terribly, terribly formal um, because I dislike that. And if I have got a very formal arch architectural layout, if you like, I want to soften that. I want plants to spill over the edges and to soften some of those straight lines. That's how I feel about the garden. And, you know, in, in the same way that I think there's no disgrace in having a few, shall we say, weeds such as nettles in your garden, I mean, you know, everybody's garden is the same, basically. The closer the to the house it is, the more formal it is. 
as you move away from the house, depending on how big it is, then it becomes less formal. And that, that's where you can incorporate some of these plants, such, such as Smyrnium perfoliatum or Impatiens balfurii, which are very informal indeed. I mean, you wouldn't want them filling your smart flower beds right underneath your windows, but <laughs> out in the, the, the wilder reaches of the garden, they're absolutely charming. And they, they're I just probably so would. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you should call yourself wild at heart, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we're, we're all three of us big fans of informality. What I think is interesting is if, if somebody who's not massively into plants went to East Ruston Old Vicarage, they may take a glance at all of the clipped yew and the, the sort of general structure and layout of some areas of the garden and think there's a lot of formality here. But then actually it's in the planting and in how things are allowed to go a bit wild and do their own thing mm. that I think that's where all the informality comes out. I sort of see those things as like the sort of sentence structure, the full stops and the capital letters they, and the stuff that happens in the middle tells the story, the wild, crazy story. But you, you need that structure for the wild craziness to make sense, I think, really. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I'm sure, I think you do, in actual fact. I went to a garden in um, Suffolk the other day, Fuller's Mill, um, just south of Paris and Edmonds, I think, and um, it... It's, it's an immaculately kept garden. It made me uncomfortable. And I don't mean that in a disparaging way. I mean it in a personal way to me, because the garden is informal in the way it's, it's laid out. It's a series of walks and island beds and woodland garden and all the rest of it. Um, but each plant has its place with a, an area of perfectly weed-free weed soil around it. I like my plants to touch each other, to hold hands, to, uh, to cuddle, to yes. snuggle. They <laughs> just didn't do that. They were very detached and slightly upright. And But I mean, I, I can't help but um, I'm in awe of the way it is kept so immaculately. And that's where my Flomo came from. But I'm gonna tell, I'll tell you about that later. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> we look forward to that. <laughs> Yes, um, the mind boils. <laughs> talking of plants snuggling and uh, and holding hands and, and also things softening the informality. And I cannot remember which it was, but when we were walking around a couple of weeks ago, there was a tropiolum that's scrambling up a yew. And it's not smithy eye. You had smithy eye scrambling up yew last year. This is a different one. And it's obviously quite vigorous, quite near the house. And that really stopped me in my tracks. And I was like, what is that? It's wonderful. Well, it did me when I first saw it in somebody else's garden, and it's called Tropiolum ciliatum, and it has flowers that are the colour of a cold cup of milky tea or parchment, I suppose, something like that. Um, and it is charming seeing these strings of flowers, you know, six or eight feet up in the air, sort of billowing out of a hedge. But it's a plant that I would warn anybody um, against, I think very carefully before you say you really want it because it is a rampageous plant. <laughs> what it does underneath the ground is quite interesting because it makes, and I suppose they're called tubers, but it makes these little round nutty shape, shaped things about as big as a, a, a Kent cob nut, I suppose, and similar colour, and then a string and then another one, then a string and then another one, then a string and then another one. And I think that's how it moves around under the ground. It puts out... It puts out a root and then makes a tuber at the end of it and then another one and so, so on and so forth. But where I've got it, it is confined by um, a border on one side and, uh, and a paving on the other. So it's not too, too vigorous, but it is a delightful thing. And many of the Tropiolum family do similar things. Um, we all know about the wonderful flame flower that doesn't like Norfolk at all, or Suffolk particularly, um, but it flowers wonderful, uh, wonderfully up north, um, great scarlet billowing masses. But I remember going to a garden in Norfolk where it did th thrive, and that was, um, where was it? It doesn't matter, but it was thriving and it was falling out of a yew hedge, this bright scarlet against this dark green of the yew hedge and it just looked stunning. Oh. One, one was flat, formal and very clipped and the other was just flinging its arms around with great delight yeah I never get the balance right between formality and informality normally it's just chaos in my garden <laughs> um, <laughs> Bridget what would you say about your plot <laughs> well uh, I think chaos would sum it up rather beautifully <laughs> I'm just not rigorous I one I can't be rigorous I I it just it isn't part of my personality to be to be rigorous Anything that offers itself up, I celebrate and go, you can stay, even when it, when I shouldn't. 
And then on top of that, if I come across something that I think, well, I really ought to take that out or I ought to cut back at seed heads or something. If I see a creature on it, well, it can stay. I'm doomed. <laughs> That's it. Uh, you know, you've made, I, I had exactly that happen to me. I would say probably about a month ago now, I'd got some self-sown um, scabious in the, in our courtyard. It just come up through the cobbles near my window where I have breakfast. And I thought, now that really is looking scruffy. Even for me, it's looking scruffy. I ought to cut that back. As I actually had the thought, I, could, I can't believe the serendipitous coincidence of this, a goldfinch came down and started eating the seed heads. And I thought, well, that's clearly not going to happen. I only cut it back yesterday. I thought, there's not a single seed head left here now. I can finally chop it back. <laughs> now, I'm like this. I've got, um, my Abbey Magus has gone over. And I, every time I go to pull it out, I see a load of ladybirds feasting on bugs. And I think, oh, you can stay another day. I'll let them have another buffet <laughs> and then I'll take it out. And it's, um, it's hopeless because you're right, Alan, you do need to edit it. It's amazing how a couple of scruffy plants can really bring a whole scheme down. <laughs> Oh, but don't come and look at my garden then. <laughs> I tell you what is is also amazing, and it, it came home to me the other day when I I'd been in the sunk garden working away about a month ago, and I went back a week uh, a week ago, I think, and I thought, but I weeded this a month ago. Where's all this lot come from? You know, and there were roses to deadhead, and goodness knows what. And then to go back to what uh, tap into something that Bridget just said. A family of goldfinches appeared. They've just flown the nest and they're, they're all chipping and chirping together and absolutely lovely. Incidentally, did you know that a flock of goldfish is known, a goldfinches is known as a charm of goldfinches? Isn't that wonderful? It is the Isn't most lovely, beautiful lovely thing. thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, one of the things that gardeners can do is leave seed heads for all birds, any of the finch family, but particularly goldfinches, because they're just so delightful. I mean, the whole family is delightful, but you know what I mean? They're because they have that little splash of red and splash of yellow on them and the, the yes. bit, of, bit of green and grey and all the rest of it. They make me um, think of little tiny woodpeckers. <laughs> you know, they're the same kind of colours. <laughs> yeah, exactly that. Yeah, they do look like um, miniature woodpeckers, except they don't peck. <laughs> <laughs> And how they can sit on the end of a scabious plant, sort of gently bouncing in the wind without mm. it landing on the floor. I mean, they must be so terribly, terribly weightless. It's incredible. Yeah. Just quietly munching away on the seeds. What a delight. Yeah. And how do they get the seeds out of teasels without pricking themselves to death? <laughs> <laughs> it's I one of my favourite seed plants in the winter. And it's always, a, I mean, I've got a self sound scabious in my front courtyard. If I look out my window here, I can see it. Um, and it's, it flopped over and it, it is looking, frankly, it looks as if it needs staking. But if I go in there and stake it, I'm going to spoil much of the things around it. So I've left it and I know I'm going to leave it throughout the winter just for the birds. Because, yes. yeah. you know, without them, a garden loses its charm as well, I think. Mm. So, well, you know, exactly. You know. It's, it, you know, there's no point creating a desert. It's, it's creating a, an environment where everything's welcome, I think. Mm. Yeah. And I it's, think, Bridget, for anybody who follows you alongside your absolutely beautiful arrangements, it's also about your kind of observations of what's going on in your garden and out on your dog walks. And wildlife is a big focus for you because you're often commenting on, you know, skylarks or your amazing um, moth sighting in your garden. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us oh about that. I was so jealous. Well, I couldn't believe it. I mean, that, they're common. This is the crazy thing. This is the elephant hawk moth. It's common. I've never knowingly actually seen one in real life. I mean, I haven't set up moth boxes and caught them through the night to look at them and that kind of thing. And it was just in my inside my kitchen on, on, the, on the window edge. And I, I, I just thought, you couldn't make this up. This is like something out of a Disney film. This pink and... Uh, the sort of uh, sagey, almost limey, if you can be sagey and limey green. <laughs> it, it was an extraordinarily beautiful thing. It was this pink was just, and I just thought, oh my goodness, you're incredible. So of course I looked it up and it, it's night flying, which is why I've never seen it, I suppose. And um, it particularly likes honeysuckle and it particularly likes um, willow herb. Now around here, we've got a lot of willow herb. I ha haven't actually got any in the garden, which is amazing. <laughs> I've brought a lot in to make um, arrangements. You'd have thought it would have self-sown by now. Um, 
So that didn't surprise me. And I've got a lot of honeysuckle in the garden. So I left it all day and I thought, right, once it starts to get a little darker, I'm going to put you out on the honeysuckle. So off he went and he wasn't there the next morning. So I hope a bird didn't get him. No, I, I put him underneath. He was all tucked in. He, he shouldn't have been caught by anybody. But what an extraordinary animal. Just the most beautiful, beautiful thing. And it's those little moments in the garden that make it all feel worthwhile, really. I could yeah. just sit there in the middle of my long grass, which isn't mown. I could sit there for hours just watching what's going on. Just two weeks ago, the... Um, common red soldier beetles. Well, honestly, I wouldn't like to tell you what they were doing in my long grass, but they were having a very, very good time. And I think there's going to be many, many more of them. Let's put it that way. And I thought, why are you all just coming to this particular little patch? There was obviously something there that was really, really attracting them. And they were, they were happy for several days. <laughs> I would like to know what your scarlet beetle's aphrodisiac is. So would I. I mean, it wasn't obvious to me, I have to say. <laughs> I mean, I'm not very good on grasses. Uh, it's something I need to... Don't you just feel that you, you never feel like you can ever have enough knowledge? You, you, yeah. I've let all of my lawn just do its own thing. So there's amazing grasses that are appearing. I've got no idea what they are. So that's a huge learning curve. The insect, the bees, I've really, I think because I've now got my, my own bees, which I keep in a sort of wild way, I've become even more, if it's possible, focused on bees. And I've noticed, I think we have 250 species in this country. Well, I think they might all be in my garden because I've seen bees. I swear I've never seen before, but I think I'm just so focused on them now. Huge ones, tiny ones, all doing that. I mean, this is the perfect time, actually, for all those pollinators to go out and see them. They're just incredible. But I need to learn them all or at least get a handle on something about them <laughs> instead of just being mystified when I look at them. <laughs> I'm always interested to see what they're drawn to. I found it amazing that if of the echinops and the, the fennel and the scabious, it was the the, the stachys byzantinus. It was the lamb's ear that all the bees wanted to go to. Above every other plant in my front garden, they were all over that, which was a shame because I wanted to cut it back because it was looking scruffy. But obviously, once I'd seen the bees on it, 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 it stayed its course. But it is really interesting looking at what they are drawn to. And I don't know whether they just get a taste for something or whether that plant is just much better for them. But um, obviously, they do tend to go for certain things in the garden. They do. Well, I'm kind of on the, oh, I hate to say this, but it's just sprung into my head, on the journey <laughs> of learning about honeybees. And as I understand it, and I'm probably wrong, so if anybody wants to correct me, that would be great. As I understand it, they, the, uh, the worker bees tend to live for only about six weeks. And in those six weeks, when, when, when it's their turn to go off foraging, they are very forage sp specific. So if that's what they're going for, the lambs is, that's what they'll do for the three weeks that they're alive doing that. Um, and then somehow somebody tells them, hold on, no, let's go for Bridget's lime tree in her garden, which at the moment is like a little humming, en well, not little because it's a huge humming engine. Absolutely. You can feel it kind of throbbing. You can hear it, this noise that's going on with all the pollinators that are going up into the canopy and the sweet, sweet scent of the flowers. It's extraordinary. I lost my scent through having COVID first lockdown. It came back about two, two months ago. And I swear, I am now so focused on every scent. I, people had always told me that that lime tree smelt really strongly because when you're living with it, you don't smell it. I can smell it this year. It's amazing. <laughs> now I know why the bees love it so much. <laughs> what are the bees all over in your garden, Alan? Well, because we had Eki and Pandanana, which we refer to as bee towers. Oh, yeah. Uh, that, that's one of the things that even when the flowers are going over, which they are now, there's much, 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 many fewer of them. Um, but they're still besieged by bees, in actual fact. Um, but it's absolutely everything, I think. You know, you notice it when you're... I mean, I was, I'll was tell you what I was doing yesterday. I walked past a buddleia, not with bees, but with butterflies, mm. of course. And um, there was, it's a young buddleia, and you can do this with young buddleias. You can't do it with a, with a, a, a huge buddleia because it's just too fiddly. But the young buddleia is 
just a little bit taller than me and I can reach the dead flowers and I was cutting off the dead flowers and there was butterflies all around me. But if you can cut back your buddleia flowers and the same goes with border flocks too, um, you know, they will reflower again. We had a very, very heavy rain fall here on uh, Saturday afternoon last um, and it completely ruined lots of the flocks flowers especially the more delicate ones and the highly bred ones with the thicker sort of petals, they seem to survive it. But the ones that verge on the wild flocks um, tend to get ruined. But if you just snip below the panicle of flower to a leaf, to a just above a leaf node, that will then produce lateral shoots, which will give you more flowers. Now you won't get a huge display of flowers like you do the first time, but it was, it's infinitely worthwhile doing. And, and, you know, that's another reason for deadheading. And I know we want to keep the, the seeds for, for the birds on lots of plants, but if you want to have a two bites of the cherry, I mean, deadhead every other stem, for instance, if you mm. want to, and there'll still be plenty left for everybody. And the same goes for when you come to the end of the year. Um, when we were, Thordis and I were talking to Val Bourne the other day, and she, Val mentioned putting the garden to bed. And, you know, how people say, well, I put the garden to bed and they come to you and almost if they want a house point or a pat on the back. <laughs> yes. That's the first thing you can really do, for, especially for wildlife. Yeah. Because all of that, um, the stuff that's left behind is very, very important for our wildlife, for all the invertebrates and insects and everything else and the birds. Um, but it's also... It, good for the human soul because if you get to the depths of January and you've got a garden that looks an absolute wreck and we have a frosty night you'll get up the next morning and you've got this winter wonderland of, of where all these skeletal forms are coated with glittery glitter I suppose Jack Frost has done his work and it just looks wonderful it so does. you it's know magic isn't it it is pure yeah. magic and there's something else to be said after that Bridget because the action of Jack Frost he makes those stems of the dead plants much easier to clear away because you know the, the the toughness is taken out of them quite often if you take your hand across a, a, a perennial plant and the, the stems will fall down like soldiers in march early march you know whereby if you do it in in september october you've got to snip 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 away um no just don't do it make life easy on yourself yeah and you haven't left anything for the ladybirds and the lace wings to overwinter in you know if you want them to come and eat your pests next year <laughs> give them somewhere to reside over winter <laughs> yeah when you've got greenhouses like that i have like i have where we have lots of tender plants that we use for our spring bedding and our, our spring our summer pots and things like that you quite often as the temperature rises end of february beginning of march you know that you'll suddenly see there's little colonies of green flies start to appear under glass because there's no frost to kill them off. And there's the greedily munching away at the new shoots on all my lovely plants. And I can go in the greenhouse like, you know, you can't squish and squat and all the rest of it. But one thing that I always look out for is uh, ladybirds. And if I find ladybirds in the garden and they're sort of in a state of torpor, they're sort of kind of, you know, they haven't quite woken up yet and all the rest of it. I take them to the greenhouse and I just lay them on a piece of leaf or bark or whatever they're, they're on and I leave them to it. And I know damn well that those little, little those lovely little red bugs are going to do their duty. <laughs> I tell you what, those ladybirds have really lucked out in your garden. It's like being in a spa, isn't it? And the butler takes you <laughs> for your treatment. And would you also I love that? Like I love that phrase, lucked out. <laughs> that ladybird was very good in a past life. It came back to, you know, a luxury life in Alan's greenhouse. Of course, Bridget, oh, if people want to sort of be able to follow your exploits in your country garden, they can actually check you out monthly in a new, very exciting, glossy magazine column. Yes, they can. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's, uh, I was very excited. So now I've got a column in uh, Country Homes and Interiors magazine, and it's called In a Country Garden. So um, I just write a little bit about what's happening in the garden, focusing more on the creatures than the plants if I'm honest <laughs> well I think my love of flowers and things is very obvious but I don't know that perhaps it's becoming more obvious that my love of the I consider my garden I, I'm 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 just a little little part of it and I just 
host this space for all of those creatures that were there long before me and hopefully will be there long after me as well. So I just kind of keep it gently for them and then celebrate their antics. <laughs> and then also in the column, I, I do an arrangement of that month and explain how to do it in a foam free way. So yeah, it's really lovely actually. I'm very honoured to be able to do that. Yeah, I shot out to uh, to see and buy a magazine from an actual shop with your column in. I'm very excited. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations, Bridget. I think that's Thank wonderful. You. But um, I I do like the comment they're foam free, um, mm. and I think I think that most people today are well aware of the fact that um, the floral foam that we used to use years ago, hopefully, is non biodegradable. Well, it's um, a microplastic. Yes. And let's go back to what our forefathers did with chicken wire and those little glass frogs that sit in the bottom of vases. I I actually, it was a nostalgic thing, because what do you do with them? I remember my in my grandmother's pantry, um, at, in her cottage at Fawnstead End, she had the most wonderful collection of things. I mean, it wasn't just... Um, the food and the, you know, the jewel box of all the bottled fruit and the jams and pickles and all that sort of thing. But it was also a collection of things. And I can remember a collection of frogs being there. And there was a green glass ones and peachy glass ones, as well as clear glass ones. Um, and for people that don't know what the hell I'm talking about, a glass <laughs> frog is a circular, usually circular piece of glass with little holes in. And you, when you're flower arranging, you put this in the bottom of your vase and if you want to, you can fix it with some kind of fixative, but people generally didn't in my day. And they used strong stems pushed into that, that the holes in that glass to hold your basic framework in space, in place. And then you worked your Bridget girling magic <laughs> and you threaded all the wonderful other things through it. Um, how do, you, do, do you use frogs actually? Yes, Adrian? I do use frogs. Yeah. I try to be gentle in my... Uh, persuading of people to move away from foam because it's it's I just don't think you should bash people over the head with things but I mean I've removed it entirely from my business I'm not going to pretend that I didn't used to use it because of course I did um but I do think just as you said Alan once mm. you know about something you, you kind of have to do everything you can to go well what do I do about this and make sure that I don't do it anymore yeah. so it's gone and I will never use the jolly stuff again. It's nasty. You cut it and it all went in your eyes and it's horrible. It's ooh, nasty, nasty stuff. But, you know, it was only invented yeah. in the 1950s. So what were people exactly. doing before then? Exactly. Exactly as you say. All these wonderful old fashioned mechanics are perfectly usable today and actually, in my eyes, celebrate the flowers more because instead of just being stuffed into this stiff thing, like your stiff roses into a stiff piece of foam and they can't do anything, <laughs> they're put into a pin frog or a frog with the holes in or just a web of chicken wire or whatever, and they can just mm. find their space and nod their head and you put something else in and their stem might move a little bit and they sort of arrange themselves. I know that sounds disingenuous, but they do. And they have a more loose, natural feel to them. And you haven't got to hide that hideous lump of green with everything else. You know, you can have a bowl <laughs> that's got a frog in the bottom and you can see the water and that's great. You're not trying to hide anything. You're not pretending. You, you can have far fewer stems and something much more delightful and delicate and garden-like. You know, that's what I always want to try and produce is something that looks yeah. very garden-esque. Good word, actually. That, that's a good word, I think. Yeah. And I think if you, if you go back to who's our most f famous flower uh, ranger? Constance Pro Spry. Absolutely. Very good book about it. She's a very sexy lady, you know. I don't know. Is she? But I mean, she 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 sort of came to the fore with using uh, perhaps unusual things like weeds, for instance, in, in her arrangement, if they suited her, vegetables, if they suited her. Um, and she had that sort of kind of free flowing. And she actually manufactured some vases. Did you know that, Bridget? Yes, they're yeah. beautiful, aren't they? I've, I've got some in the style, but I don't think they're actually hers behind me. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I led you to that. <laughs> Behind you. Oh, you know how nosy I am. I can't, can't resist looking in your cupboards. And I, <laughs> and I did sort of think that some of those vases are very, um, shall we say, Constance Spry-esque. Um, yes. That, and if you look at the shape of the, 
the vase themselves, the vase invites a flower to fall over the edge or to curve. They are quite curvy vases. Um, they are perhaps arguably sexy themselves. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a woman. <laughs> And they're talking of sexy and sinuous. Uh, several of your arrangements could be described as such. They're certainly full of uh, personality, full of va <laughs> Um and, and obviously also very much inspired by what is looking fabulous in your garden. And I think you've brought some show and tell to that effect as well. So apart from this tantalising vase that's over your shoulder with scabious and dahlias and amimages or whatever in it, what else have you brought to show us? Well, before, when I've done my show and tell, I've brought you my more cultivated plants that I've sown from seed or perennials or whatever. I thought I'd show you my welcome, well, what's welcome at the moment in the garden? I think you probably got the gist that most weeds are welcome. <laughs> weeds. They're not really weeds. They're wildflowers. They're just considered weeds because they're a bit vigorous, shall we say. <laughs> um but I have got a, I really, really do celebrate the wildflowers and I love to use them in my arrangements. So here's a little collection. So they're never as showy and as flamboyant as the cultivated. But the, what led me to showing you this was yesterday morning, I went down to my greenhouse and I have got some Joe Pye weed, which mm. I have written down the... Eupatorium. Eupatorium, yes, maculatum. Yeah. I, I knew I didn't need to write it down. I knew you'd know, Ellen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm terrible for just using the common name. And it's it's um, spreading gently itself. I mean, I'm in dry, sandy soil, which I know I was moan about. And this is supposed to like damp yeah, soil. It, does. it seems to like my soil. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Because I've got similar soil to you. Um, and it likes me. But it's also, you often see it growing on the sides of ditches. Yes, Exactly. Well, everything I'm going to show you will happily grow <laughs> in a ditch. And Joe Pye weed is a very, very good weed for insects. They love it. Well, this is why I thought my show and tell today has got to be about all the things that attract the insects that I also use in my arrangements. Because I went down there and it was early morning and it's in sunshine and it was covered in butterflies. Mm. It was absolutely festooned with them. And I thought... Why wouldn't you have this spreading everywhere? Because you've just got so much joy happening there with all of the butterflies flitting. And you kind of, you go there and they're, they're sort of all around your, and they're on your shoulders and things. And you just think, this is amazing. I just, it was just so exciting. So I love this stuff. It is a bit of a thug. You do have to be careful. If you've got water retentive soil, only have a little bit and then watch it like a hawk is what I'd say. <laughs> But if you want to attract butterflies this time of year, this is your friend. It's just amazing. So here's my first little thing. And then this I did actually grow from seed and I didn't really realise that this is also a wild flower. Do you know this one, Alan? I, I want to say it's a linaria, but I'm not sure. No, it's not. Hold on, I'll just go to my notes. <laughs> <laughs> it's called, not unsurprisingly, uh, tall... Melilot, M-E-L-I-T-O-T. -T. Melilot, yeah. And then the uh, Latin is Meliloto <laughs> Melilotus Altissimus. Altissimus. <laughs> oh, my goodness, I'm so good at Latin. You can tell I studied it at school. <laughs> but I think the yellow is much more common in the wild. I think it came in the 16th century, but it's naturalised and it likes scrubby ground. So I think it's going to be very happy in my, my garden. Um, and it makes beautiful pea shoots, uh, uh, pea pods. And I think I probably will have quite a lot of it going forward. <laughs> Last year, it was just a little plant that didn't do anything. But this year it's and it's so tall. I mean, it, it needs its tall at the front of the name because it really is tall. But I love that. I like feeling tiny in the garden. But it's full of bees and butterflies again. The most insignificant looking thing, but makes the most incredible arrangement. It's known as the yellow sweet clover. Sweet of ah. bees and butterflies and insects like it. That makes sense because it's got the little three um, leafed mm. uh, leaves, three leafed leaves. <laughs> So this, I would highly recommend if you want to attract insects as well. 
And then use it in an arrangement. That white one's lovely, isn't it? I mean, the yellow one's lovely, but that white one's magic. It really is magic. I did an arrangement a couple of weeks ago and it just had this and Annie in it. And I just thought that is, although I say so myself, quite heavenly. (laughs) (laughs) And then this is my little uh, scabious, the naughtier, I think it's called field scabious. Yep. This is the one that the uh, little uh, goldfinches were eating the seeds from. So I'm hoping that this is going to start to gently spread through my long grass because I think that would be magical. There's a meadow just two or three houses down from me and it's full of this. And I just think, spread yourself everywhere and I'll be really happy. But again, it's you can see it's so different from the cultivated form. Yeah. But, I mean, big and blousy. Soft and delicate. <laughs> and this attracts the bees. It has bees and butterflies on it all of the time. But I don't know whether this has got anything to offer goldfinches. Maybe it has. I'm not sure. That, that, that little scabious is known as Nautia arvensis. Yes. Hmm. I did write that down too, but I knew you'd know it. <laughs> <laughs> I did my research. And then I have loads of... Ach- now, how do you say this? Achelia, Achilla... Achillea. Achillea. Mm. Obviously on my soil, this is a very, very happy plant, but this is the wild one that is growing up through my grass. And I've got it in all sorts of different colours. In fact, it is a bit of a thug in my garden. But again, it is covered in insects all of the time. And the um, I, I particularly like this white one. A bit like you said about your plant, it's parchment. It's not really white. It's like a dirty white, really. <laughs> so it's not glaring in an arrangement it will just sit gently under other flowers and be the the backing singer to what's going on with the other more blousy things that are showing off (laughs) (laughs) so I love this and my little uh, red common red soldier beetles quite like this too (laughs) that's where they made their bed (laughs) yes there's plenty more for them and then I'm sure lots of people have this in their garden I think we've mentioned it as well. Good old Dorcas. I mean. Dorcas Carotta. Is, is there anything more beautiful? It's just like, it's, it is an extra fact of wild carrot, isn't it? Yes, hmm. it is. So, and then you, so you have all of this and then you have this oh, incredible yeah. structure. And you just think, honestly, you couldn't make it up. It's just uh, delightful. So again, I use them all the time in arrangements. But they're wild. They do their own thing. They really are wild. They spread beautifully. (laughs) (laughs) And going back to that thing you were saying, Alan, about plants that don't die disgracefully, it's wonderful if something can, as it develops, just keep on offering different characteristics and different interests. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's it's a bit like the spires of Eki and Pine and Anna. I don't take them down until the following year. I leave them. And I mean, okay, at the end of the winter, they will look gaunt and rather shabby and all the rest of it. But they've been home to lots of hibernating little things that, um, I mean, they're too numerous to mention. But, you know, why take away somebody's home when they mm. need it through the winter? And they could, when, in actual fact, what you're doing is you're depriving them yourself of their services the following year. Mm. Because we need to encourage all these beneficial and perhaps non-beneficial insects as well, because it's all about balance. And the one predates upon the other. And without food, the one that eats you is going to die. Um, so we need to have a little bit of something for everybody, much like our world. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Full circle. And going back to the Echiums, I can't remember if it was Henstead Exotic Garden I went to in Suffolk, but um, there was such a clear idea as well of just showing the life cycle. Because obviously with an Echium, Pinanana, Pinanana, however we want to say it, you get, you know, the first rosette and then have many years later it might flower and then you can be left with the skeleton once it's died. And it's quite nice to see that whole life cycle in one mm. area. And yes, it has be- its own beauty. From this to this to this, because a lot of yeah. people don't realise that that sheet of tiny little seedlings is going to turn into this monster, you know, 12, 14 feet tall. I mean, that's uh, amazing. But I would just say to people one thing, in, unless you have... Um, you're lucky enough to let your echium cell seed, you're unlikely to get to that height because 
the they dislike being tr transplanted however small you do it and they'll make a decent height but they won't go to that real sort really really tall height i had a couple outside my kitchen window this year were well, three one of them flopped over onto the wall but the other two remained straight and they spent their winter in in the teeth of a north northerly gale which was cold for about six weeks and I, they were all shriveled around the edges and i thought are they going to die they're not going to make it and then suddenly from this shriveled mass of leaves, this spire started to grow and it grew by the day. And they did get to between 12 and 14 feet tall. They are absolutely, well, two of them are still majestic. The other one flopped, but, you know. But they must, going back to your uh, mentioning the frost in the winter, they must look fantastic when they're glittering. Yeah, they would. I also like, as an aside, that anyone who's paying close attention will have counted the cuckoos then and known exactly what time we're thinking. recording at. <laughs> Oh, hello. Has the no. cuckoo returned? No, you don't. You don't because in actual fact it's a cuckoo and an echo. And, an echo. <laughs> and, and people count it and they, it can be quite wrong. So you, you cannot be sure. Keeping them guessing. <laughs> so, so of your wild show and tell, Bridget, have we, have we worked our way through everything? What else have I got in here? Well, I've got two more, if you've got time for them. Yeah. Uh, and th yeah, they're, you know, uh, they're, there's nothing there's nothing sexy about them, to use our common word that we're <laughs> going back to. But look, these guys, the, the uh, red campion, still flowering, yeah. still doing its thing. And at this time of year, it's got this incredible, instead of having a green stem, the stem's gone red. You know, it's, it's red campion with a red stem. It's still the same plant, but it's kind of changed as the weather's changed. And again, fabulous for the insects. And the seed head is just the most, I mean, I would encourage people to go and look at seed heads. They are extraordinarily beautiful. The seed heads of anything, but the, the, um, this red campion, they're like little cups. And the cups are, have got little curled edges full of little seeds. And you just think, isn't nature clever? It's just filled this little cup with seeds and as the wind comes along they just sort of shake out gently and you end up with billions of plants <laughs> but it's just so beautiful such a beautiful engineering construction that happens and right in front of our eyes and most of the time we don't notice it it's amazing i love crane's bill seeds just the idea that when they're ready they just catapult away you know they curl up and spring their seed far yes, far away the from the parents in that yeah. it's just it's like Himalayan balsam, which I know is desperate, but I did have it in a garden, a previous garden, and you could hear it crack and pop. It was, <laughs> I mean, I can't even begin to imagine how fast they were catapulting out of those pods. Yeah. Frightening plant. Euphorbias do something similar in actual fact, that they, on a hot day, you can hear the, they're like a little pistol shot, crack, and they fling their seeds. Um, you have just answered a question. <laughs> That I had had, and it was, I don't, it must probably be about six weeks ago. Would it have been longer? And I, it was a boiling hot day. And I thought, what is that? And I stood there really still thinking, I'm going to catch it. Whatever is making that popping noise, I'm going to find out. I never did. But I did start to focus on that thinking, is it you? Fabulous. Now I know. I haven't got to worry yeah. about it anymore. <laughs> But it's really distinct. It's like gorse as well. Gorse will do that. If you're on a walk on a hot day, you can hear that cracking. It's just phenomenal. Yeah. Amazing. Oh, I love it. Nature <laughs> looking beautiful, sounding beautiful as well. Absolutely. Do you want to see my last one? Have yes. You got time? Final show and tell. Underneath all of the, because I don't really do bare soil, going back to Fuller's Mill, I'm <laughs> the opposite. <laughs> I've got oh, so many of these little darlings, absolutely everywhere. And again, you have to you have to go and search for them because they're really hiding. But they're all there, attracting little insects, just doing their thing, and they just make me very, very happy. <laughs> Isn't it amazing when you actually think that that charming little heart sees the plant there? Um, is the forerunner of all the pansies and violas that we grow today. And they've been bred from that wildflower. It's, it's quite incredible, hard. isn't it? Mm. And various, um, there's various varieties that come from around the world. We grow one in the garden, which is called Viola hederacea, um, which has lovely little purple and white flowers. And it flowers in shade practically the whole summer long into the autumn as well. First saw that growing at Hyde Hall, took a picture, 
thought, must have it. I bought a seed tray of, of, of plugs, in actual fact, of it, and I left them rather longer than I thought I should. I knew I should. And when I tried to get the plugs out, they'd all intermingled and they were rooting and they root as they go. So they make these long stems and root and go. So they're ideal for carpeting sort of, shall we say, shady damp areas where perhaps you haven't got an awful lot of plants that are growing. If you're growing ferns, it goes it grows amongst them. And it's absolutely beautiful. But like mm. you say, uh, Bridget, you have to go and search for them because they're down there at the bottom. They are at the bottom. And I think I think that's another thing. It's It's kind of... I really want to encourage people to just, whatever the weather, just go out there and have a look because it will make your heart feel a little easier if you just go out there and find a little treasure. It's just a wonderful thing, you know, whether that's walking along the hedgerow or in somebody else's garden, if you haven't got your own garden, you know, that go out there and have a little look. There's so much going on that will just make you think, you know, life's all right, really. <laughs> and if you're lucky enough to be a passenger in a car, certainly over the past months, I've enjoyed many uh, a wildflower from the passenger seat as we've uh, gone on holiday or just driven around the area. The chicory this year has been gorgeous. Certain roadside verges just awash with these beautiful blue starry flowers. And as ever, the A11, I'm often on the A11 between Cambridge and Norwich, often going up to East Rusknell Vicarage. And the Vipers Bugloss along the A11, you just get these swathes of rich rich blue and it's um i always wish i could just pull over and go and look at it and it's not not really uh doable unfortunately but it's wonderful it is beautiful you just think it's it's nature just showing you how beautiful natural planting can be right well uh, there's been a huge amount of wildflower appreciation i don't know if that will feed into our flow mo this week but if you've never tuned in before, if you're just a big fan of Bridget and you've come along to listen to this podcast, well, good on you for joining us um, for some flowery chat. What we always like to do is share a plant that we've seen in a garden, on social media, in a magazine that we've read about, that we are having FOMO about, our floral or plant-based FOMO. Mine was brought about this week by Walk Around Ely. And uh, they've got a lovely little almondry where there's a cafe and a lovely little bit of planting. So I walked through there and over a little archway, they had a bright pink clematis, which was intermingling with a yellow umbellifer. And I didn't pause long enough to pay attention to the umbellifer to know which it was, but a very fennelly kind of zingy yellow. And this pink in combination was fantastic. And the lovely people of Instagram have let me know it was probably Princess Diana. So I think I might need a bit of Princess Diana to grow near my copious quantities of fennel so that I can have that lovely pink and yellow combination. So that's on my list this week. What about you, Bridget? Well, last time I was with you, my flomo was Echinacea palladia. Oh, yes. And I sowed the seeds and they were all doing terribly, terribly well. And I have not got a single seedling left don't know what went wrong. So that was a disaster. So that's still on my list. <laughs> but my new one, and it's not, it's nothing exotic, but um, it's uh, Helenium, Moorheim Beauty. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I very really, really want that. And I have tried various Heleniums in the past. And again, they haven't really come to much. But of course, I'm not very good at giving them a bit of space when they're starting off. So I do know I am half the problem. <laughs> but I have this fantasy of having a bit more of a sort of prairie look in some areas and and just having that particularly going through the autumn would just be amazing so that's oh. definitely my big big flomo beautiful also can i just share echinacea success so often we talk about how they don't come back particularly on my soil and i love them and last year i couldn't stop myself from buying one and i knew i shouldn't buy it but it wasn't very much money and it was all of my colors all my sunsetty pinks and oranges so i bought it and I kept it in a pot to begin with. And I think I must have planted it in the spring finally, because I was trying to have a clear out of all the plants in my holding pen. And it blow me down. It's it's flowering. It's got multi, it's got at least two flowers happening. And I can't remember the name because I was so sure it would die. I haven't got the label anymore. <laughs> so I'll put a photo on this. And if you know what it is, if it looks familiar, please comment below the video on YouTube or send us a message or something. Um, I would love to, to know what I've actually managed to grow for two years. But it's a beautiful orangey pinky echinacea and um, it's making me very, very happy. So thank you for reminding me, Bridget. <laughs> Sounds like it might be one I might need. Forget yeah, I think. Canadian. I mean, I don't know if it'll survive more than two years, but it's it's done that well. 
<laughs> right, Alan, what was your Fuller's Mill inspired FLOMO? Well, Fuller's Mill is uh, a very nice garden to go and visit. It, I, I've said disparagingly probably that it makes me feel uncomfortable because it's too tidy. Perhaps I also feel a little bit guilty, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but it is a very inspiring garden to see how they put plants together, not too close together because they're not close together, but, you know, in conjunction with one another. And there's also the, the thrill of seeing new plants that you've not seen before, but then you suddenly come upon an old friend grown a different way, which is what happened to me. And now there's an ivy, I mean, boring old ivy, but one of the most important plants for wildlife in the garden and our countryside. But there's a variety called Heterohelix erecta, which means it's a fastidiate ivy. So all the shoots grow upright. It's very formal looking and very stiff and starchy, rather like an old matron, really. <laughs> I saw Heterohelix erecta, grown against a wall. Now, most people don't do that. They use it as a landscape plant in their gardens or as an upright, as an accent, if you like, in a boredom. Oh, look at that, that's an ivy. It's a different one, it grows a different way. But they'd grown it against a wall. So these uprights actually climbed the wall. And it was a completely different form uh, and shape to what we usually see when an ivy climbs the wall. It was very formal and it looked rather nice. So that's, uh, it's not really a flomo, is it? It's something that I'm going to do in college to Fuller's Mill because I hadn't thought of it and they had. But there you are. How high did it get up the wall? It had got to about eight feet. Oh, gosh. Yes. That is tall, isn't and, it? But, and, and, of course, the great thing about ivy is that ivy will grow in dark corners. Hmm. Um, so if you've got sort of, you know... And the other thing I mentioned the other day was uh, uh, somebody was talking about an ivy and it's a form called buttercup, which is an ivy with yellow leaves. If you grow that ivy in full sun, the leaves scorch and look rather horrid. But if you grow it on the north side of a wall, it brightens up the whole area and you get shades of... No, if I say buttercup green, you know what I mean. It's on the limey side and not too bright a yellow. Um, it just looks lovely. So I think ivies have got to be... Um, something of a plant of the moment in a way, because I seem to be discovering lots of different ones because they, you know, they've, they've all got the different varieties. They've got different sized leaves, different shaped leaves. Um, you know, there's one that I love, which is called pink and curly, which in the winter has leaves that go sort of pinky brown on the outsides. They look oh. almost as if they're, as if they are dying, but they're not. I mean, it's just the temperature that does that, but the leaves are twisted and curly. Um, there's such a, I mean, just have a look. Fibrex. Have a, look at, have a look at Fibrex. Fibrex Nurseries, yes, they do a wonderful selection of ivies. And of course, when we had the shows at the Westminster Halls, they used to do um, really lovely exhibits. And one of the things that Fibrex was excellent at doing, and that was taking an ordinary ivy that will climb a wall, and they get it with a stem, two or three plants together, you can plait the stem or just wind them around each other, and then they clip the top into a ball. So you've got this wonderful sort of lollipop shape, if you like. And they had them in different shades and different colours, you know, white variegated, yellow variegated, dark green, pale green, so on and so forth. It was fascinating. Another little tip. If you want to grow ivy in your garden and you haven't got space for it to climb, take a cutting from a flowered shoot or a shoot that's had berries on it. If you grow that cutting, it won't climb. It will remain, um, a, a, it, it will remain shrub-like because... You know, ivy has two forms of growth, the yes. climbing growth and the flowering growth. The flowering growth will stay like a bush. Christopher Lloyd has a lot to answer for because I read that in one of his books. And I remember going to Dix Dixter and seeing a great big dollop, a dome, almost as big as a table, a circular table, you know, clipped outside one of the areas in the garden. And, and it was um, Heterohelix uh, Gloida Marengo, I think, the large white variegated leafed ivy, and it just looked tremendous. But because I was seeing ivy as I hadn't seen it grown before, much like Fuller's Mill. Inspiring ivy. Mm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, there's a title for a programme. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> just remember, Alan had the idea, so he needs the money if you make it. <laughs> Oh, Bridget, thank you very much. We will continue to watch your exploits on Instagram and now read your new column in uh, Country oh, Homes and Interiors. You. Thank you so much I... for having me. I love being with you too. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. I'm, I've just made a notice in my book to go and order Country House and Interiors magazine. So there you are. <laughs> there you go, Bridget. You should get a commission.
Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, farewell, you lovely people. Happy gardening, everyone. Yes, happy gardening. All the best. Bye. Bye. And are you okay for Flomo? Yep. Are you okay for Flomo, Alan? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've done it. Oh. Oh my goodness. That was I good. wish I could be that jolly fast. I know. <laughs> You've frozen on my screen and I don't know how to do I suppose I've got my mouth open as if I'm snoring. <laughs> no, you're kind of, let's see if I can emulate you. You're kind of going. <laughs> That's, it could be a lot worse, Alan. Oh, now, are you, are you... He's staying still on purpose. Are you staying? You are staying still on purpose. <laughs> you are so naughty. <laughs>